Hi everyone, my name is Noah and welcome to our virtual water festival presentation. Today, after going over a little bit more of introducing myself, we are going to talk about what is the atmosphere. We'll talk about the water cycle, which is probably going to be a little bit of a review for many of you. We'll briefly touch on the differences between weather versus climate. And then I'm going to go over how scientists measure precipitation, specifically for the National Weather Service. So like I said, my name is Noah Newman, and I am a scientist at Colorado State University. And I work for the Atmospheric Science Department. Atmospheric Science, that's kind of a big word. Throughout today's lesson, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, and that's because scientists ask questions. So when I ask a question, I'm also going to play a sound, just like that. And when I do, you can pause the video and take a moment to answer those questions or think about it in your head. And then you can unpause and we'll go on to the, uh, we'll continue on. So. Again, I work as a scientist in the Atmospheric Science Department at Colorado State University. So my first question for you is, what is the atmosphere? What sort of things do you think about when, you, when someone says the atmosphere? And when we think about the atmosphere, a lot of people will start to talk about the different layers of the atmosphere. And, you know, honestly, the, the atmosphere starts right here on the ground, and it goes all the way up to where outer space begins. And so it's kind of everything in between. It's the air that we breathe. It's the clouds in the sky. Um, and so my next question for you is, what, how does the atmosphere protect us? Think about some of the things that are maybe up here beyond the atmosphere, and what sort of things, how does the atmosphere protect us? So some of you might be thinking about uh, rocks from outer space. We call them meteorites. And if any of you have ever seen a shooting star, what that is is usually a, a, a piece of uh, rock from outer space, but it's usually only about the size of a grain of sand. But if it's going 20,000 miles an hour, it burns up in our atmosphere, and we can see that as a shooting star. Um, without our atmosphere, even a grain of sand going that fast would uh, cause havoc and devastation across all of our planet. So without our atmosphere, we would be in a lot of trouble. The other thing that the atmosphere protects us from is the sun. And if we think about it, uh, we, it doesn't protect us all the way because we do have to use sunscreen still. But without our atmosphere, our, we would very likely burn up to a crisp. And then, of course, at nighttime, we would freeze to death. So our atmosphere is uh, keeping us alive, and it's a good thing. So the next thing I'm going to uh, talk about is the water cycle. And as a scientist who studies the atmosphere, uh, I'm, I like to study parts of the water cycle. And so to begin with, uh, the first thing that, that I like to talk about when it comes to the water cycle, it's something that's missing from this screen here, but it's something that's big and bright, and it rises every day. And I'll go ahead, and you can think about it. And of course, the answer is the sun. Yes, the sun is responsible for, for driving the water cycle. It's kind of the, the it, it power, it's like the engine that drives it. And so as the sun rises and uh, heats up the water, the first part of the water cycle that uh, I'll ask you to, to name is, is when the sun comes out and heats up that water and all the water molecules rise up in the sky and they're invisible. We can't see them. And what do we call that? We call that evaporation. And of course, uh, it's not just the water that evaporates. It's the trees and the grass and the plants and animals. You and me, we even transpire, transpiration. So all of that water goes up into the sky. And as it gets higher and higher and it uh, cools down and comes together, it forms these clouds. And what do we call that part of the water cycle? We call it condensation. Very good. I'm sure most of you got that. 
And so condensation is where all the water molecules come together and they form clouds, but eventually those clouds start to, uh, things fall out of the clouds, I should say, and so I don't want to give away the key word here, but go ahead and it's a big word and it starts with the letter P. Yes, precipitation. And so, just for fun, I'd like to also ask you a question. If you can name one type of precipitation, name one thing that falls out of clouds, and go ahead and maybe ask around the class. And the answer to that would be rain, hail, snow, and the final one that is not always remembered, but it's kind of a mixture of rain and snow at the same time, and we call that sleet. And so the picture here is actually none of the above. This is just uh, uh, neat ice crystals that have uh, condensed on the outside of this rain gauge. So when we measure the weather, and whether it's precipitation or temperature, you can see these devices here measure temperature. There's some thermometers in here. Here's a rain gauge. Here's another rain gauge. This is to measure evaporation. So there are lots of things that we can measure, but when, we, when we're when we measuring uh, things of the, uh, items from the weather, that's different than the climate. I'm sure many of you have heard the word climate, and we talk about climate change. So I'm going to ask the question, what, what do you think the difference is between weather versus climate? So oftentimes when I think about the differences between weather versus climate, I'm thinking about time. I'm thinking about when I'm doing a weather observations, it's, it's what's happening right here and right now. But when we're talking about climate, we're talking about what happened maybe today, but also what happened a year ago on this date, or two years ago on this date, or 30 years ago on this date. So when it comes to talking about climate, you're actually turning into a historian. You're looking at past weather data, and you can see here, this uh, we had people in the United States, this one is in Denver, Colorado, measuring way back in 1871 with very meticulous notes and beautiful handwriting. But if we compare all those measurements throughout all the years, we can start to get a feel for what the climate is. So that, that's kind of the difference between weather versus climate. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is how scientists measure precipitation. And we talked about those types of precipitation, rain, hail, snow, and sleet, and so I'm going to talk briefly about how that's done. This is a rain gauge, and this is an official one that are that are used by volunteers all over the United States, and you too could get one of these gauges and help out the National Weather Service by taking accurate measurements of what falls in this gauge. So you can see there's four parts. There's this outer cylinder here, and then you've got the inner tube, the measuring tube, and the mounting bracket, but we also have a funnel. And so what's going on here is that if you didn't have the funnel in place and, and an inch of rain fell into here, and let's say I even held a ruler up next to it, you could see that it kind of almost basically wants to come up to one inch of water. But it'd be really hard if you just stuck a ruler in there and tried to be accurate with how how deep that water is. And so if we measure, if we pour it into this, this calibrated inner tube, one inch of water would go all the way to the top where it says 1 inch, 1.00. And so there's 100 tick marks up and down this whole thing. You can see 10, 20, 30. How, how many hundredths of an inch out of 100, how many hundredths would it be if I had a half of an inch? That's right, it would come up to 50. How about 3 quarters of an inch? Yep, that would be right around 75. And so the key here is is that we want to be accurate, and we want to be accurate to the nearest hundredth of an inch. 
So if I didn't quite have an inch and I poured it into my inner tube and we looked at it right here and this is slightly off but if it were lining up right with this line right here how would you write this in decimal form? And how might you say the measurement out loud? Yep, we'd write down 0 0.91 hundredths of an inch, or we, we could say 91 hundredths of an inch. Now, in the case where it, me it rains more than an inch in this thing, what happens is you can see the gauge is filled with more water here and the initial inner tube was also filled up to an inch so you f you pour out that first inch and you write it down and then you use the funnel and you pour the um, remaining water into the inner tube and you keep on doing that and you keep on writing it down until you've got it all emptied out and you add it all up and that's the easy way to do it one cool thing that I want to show you guys and it wasn't really in that previous image because I was using very clean water and a brand new inner tube. But when you get rainwater, you end up, there's a little bit of dirt in there, and, and you end up with what what's called the meniscus. And it's this curved feature here. And what's going on is that water has some neat properties where it kind of tries to, it sticks to things. It sticks to itself, and you can sometimes see little beads of water sticking to the outside of the inner tube. And so what's going on is that water is trying to stick to the inner tube and the gravity is pulling the center of it down. And so what we want to do is always measure from the bottom of the meniscus. You can see here the, the, the water takes up probably two hundredths of an inch. So we would look at the very bottom and measure it from there. So to finish off, I'll uh, briefly talk about measuring some other aspects of uh, precipitation. When we measure hail, this is a huge uh, hailstone uh, that fell in Vivian, South Dakota. It's the largest hailstone to ever fall in the United States that's been recorded. But what we do is we take a piece of styrofoam and you cover it with tin foil and you secure it on the ground just like we're seeing here. And after a hailstone, it leaves these indentations. And scientists, we can count the number, we can look at the different size, we can actually even see the angle of impact on these things. So this is something that you can make at home and you could measure hail right from your own backyard. Finally, to measure snow, it's a little bit more uh, intense and, and tricky, but for the most part what we do is we remove the funnel and inner tube from our gauge and you let the snow fall into the gauge. And the first thing we would do is melt this and measure the, the liquid amount. And then another measurement, of course most of us are familiar with just sticking a ruler in the snow and measuring how deep the snow is. But a third measurement can actually entail taking that empty rain gauge and sticking it upside down into the snow and getting yourself a core sample of all the snow that is on the ground. And again, you can bring that inside where you would melt that snow and figure out how much water is in there. So when people do this in cases of real deep snow, you, you got to be pretty dedicated. This gentleman even built some steps and he brought a little stove to help melt the melt the snow that was in his gauge. So. It can, it can get pretty intense, especially if you live uh, high up in the mountains with super deep snow. But this is fun. You can see the smile on his face. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending our virtual water festival. I really hope you learned something today, especially about not only the atmosphere and uh, weather versus climate and the water cycle and, of course, how we measure precipitation. So thank you very much, and we hope you have a great day.